Hey Kai Alpha, um, welcome. Um, join us as we sing the first two songs. Um, we encourage you to sing along. And here we go. One, two, three, and. <laughs>
Welcome, everybody. It's so good to have you with us. I'm here with a long-term friend and actual alumnus of the ministry who I'm going to call D, uh, because D serves as a missionary in a country where that fact would not be favorably looked upon. Uh, and I've invited her here today to talk about um, uh, how, as, as followers of Jesus, we should think about missionary work, uh, missionary work in closed countries, uh, and um, how people, uh, how outsiders view that part of our faith. So I'm going to start very simply. Uh, Dee, welcome. And could you please just describe just what you do? What, what does a typical day look like? What constitutes success for you? Sure. Um, so one of the main things of being here is I have like, a, we call it a platform. It's the reason that I can come and be here in this country. It's the job that I do here. And so that's what most people here would identify me as. Um, so I spend, you know, like several hours a day engaged in that kind of work. Um, fortunately, because my boss is like-minded and also knows that I'm here to do ministry, those hours, you know, we don't, it's, I'm not working a 40 hour week doing that, which gives me the freedom and flexibility to do some other things that I consider important being here. Um, so when I first arrived, I spent a considerable amount of time doing language, probably 20 hours a week. Um, I was doing in language classes in addition to doing listening exercises and um, spending time with people to improve my ability to communicate in the local language, um, which is really important, um, both in some, giving you access into some people's lives. If they don't speak English, you have to learn their language and also being able to communicate the good news about Jesus in their heart language. That it's not coming from, they don't have to, they don't have to learn something to accept the gospel. Like it's my responsibility to learn to communicate it in a way that they can understand. Um, so that's a big part of what I did in the beginning. And then as that, as I improved and am able to communicate better now, uh, I'm able to spend more time in, um, spending time with people. And that's a lot like in campus ministry, I'm sure in what you do, you spend a lot of time uh, with people. And so we look at that um, kind of three main things to use a planting kind of farming analogy. Some of the time we spend is sowing. So that's the casual hangout, the getting together with people and looking for opportunities, of course, to share Jesus, but also getting to know them and just building trust, hearing where they're at, seeing, is this someone who's interested when I share something about Jesus? Do they have questions or are they, 
closed off, um, trying to discern where someone's at in their spiritual journey and how I can sow into their life seeds of truth of God's word or something from my personal testimony. And then um, I've had in the last year and a half, maybe a couple of friends that have moved into this watering phase. And that means uh, they're someone who is actively interested in studying God's word. So we, um, when we get together, our time often includes, hey, let's open the Bible and read a story about Jesus. Or let me send you something to listen to and then let's talk about it the next time we get together. Um, and then there are a few people that our team is in contact with who have made the next step to like reaping. So there's someone who has made a decision to follow Jesus um, and be baptized. That's a very significant part of someone's spiritual journey here that really indicates like I've thought through. It's not just words that I'm saying I want to show with my actions that I am embracing Jesus as my savior. And so um, that can look, sometimes you go into those, especially the sewing part, and it can look kind of awkward. It, you're getting to know people. Um, I'm new here, new-ish relatively, you know, compared to people who've lived their whole life here. So I'm trying to establish, like, who is my circle of friends? And um, and it can also look fun. It's, I get to spend time, like, hanging out with people and that work. Um, so obviously I'm looking for who we want to move farther, who's ready to move farther along in that journey, not me moving them. Um, so that's big parts of it. And then also I'm here as part of a team. I'm not alone. And so we make specific times, a couple times a week to meet together and pray. Um, we need like prayer is part of our work here to pray over the things that we see and know and also pray over the spiritual environment um, and then also meeting as our team for fellowship and kind of our church meeting is really a house church that uh, meets together here. So are you or are your converts in any actual danger, like physical danger, or is it more social ostracism? What are some of the challenges you face in that regard? Sure. Um, I feel like the dangers, if you want to call it, for myself or someone from the outside are very different from someone that is in the community here. Um, because for me, the main thing would be the reason why, for example, I don't want to show my face here is because I could get kicked out of the country and not allowed to come back in and continue work here. So I'm just trying to, you know, be careful about what I share online because anyone could stumble upon it. Um, for people here, it's not so much of a um, institutional kind of thing that will happen, like they'll get thrown in prison, but the family persecution. Um, there's people who have been physically harmed, killed, um, thrown out of their home, cut off from all financial support, you know, things like that are more the real realities facing someone who decides to follow Jesus here. Um, so, and in most, I would say here, it more comes from family than from friends or people outside of their immediate family. And then another thing you mentioned uh, that I did want to address is what does success look like? And actually, I often, uh, share something that you shared uh, that has stuck with me, which is um, coming from, you know, what I trained to do, where there's very tangible results. And I remember you gave the example of like coding, programming, you know, and writing a certain number of lines of computer code. It's really easy to quantify what you accomplished that day even. Or for a writer, like, yeah, what you wrote. But for someone whose main job is relationally working with people, sharing with them, discipling them. Sometimes the growth, it doesn't, you, you get through a day and you're like, what did I accomplish? And so um, I think the thing was, the thing that you said was like, well, having, being available for God to use in those discussions with people 
is what really matters. And like, you might not see the results of that conversation until sometime later in their life, but it is important work that we're doing. And it's a mindset shift to go from producing output to like investing in relationships over the long term. So I don't know if you remember saying that or have anything to add to it, but I certainly uh, feel that here. And it's something God's had to work in me to go, okay, it's not about your physical output that you're putting out into the world, but it's about the relationships you're investing in. So I do remember that. I've actually, I don't know if you, you may not realize this. I actually wrote a whole essay about that for myself uh, back in the day that I share with our ministry trainees. I'll put the link uh, in the chat bar for anybody who's curious about um, how you can quantify um, or think about productivity, I suppose is a better way to put it, in terms of your, your, your gospel life, your, your serving of the Lord. Um, that's so touching. I'm really encouraged to hear that. Um, so Dee, when did you first begin to suspect that God was calling you into missionary work? Um, that would be at a Stanford Chi Alpha meeting. <laughs> uh, there was, when I was a student there and nearing graduation, uh, there was a week where you invited two groups to come in at the same time. One was a group that talked about um, the biblical basis for mission. So they went through a lot of scriptures, um, you know, like Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the good news. Um, and some other ones, just looking how it's all through scripture, how God wants us to share his message widely and broadly. Um, so that, and then they also said there's some reasons, and they listed four main reasons why people don't consider overseas work themselves. Um, money, how am I going to finance that? Family, what's my family going to say? Or they wouldn't, I know they wouldn't support that maybe if they're not believers in Jesus? Um, how am I going to get married if I go move to some foreign country? And finally, people who say, I'm willing to go, but I'm just not called to do that. However, they've never truly asked God what he wants from them. And that was the category I fit into. The other ones, yes, I felt those concerns about the money, about the family, about the um, really marriage. I felt those, but the fourth one really hit me in my heart. And so I did nothing about it. So then this other person came and talked uh, to our large group and really challenged us. Um, she spoke from Hebrews chapter 11 about Abraham and people like him who lived in faith and didn't even receive the things that God promised them um, in their life. But it, it indicated, like, it talks about kind of this greater storyline of how God's working um, and specifically said that these people um, didn't, they were looking forward to a heavenly homeland. They didn't think about the place that they had come from. And this idea of like my citizenship being in heaven and then being willing to go wherever God might send me, that's what caused me to go back to my dorm room that night and ask God, um, do you want me to be a missionary? And I was really scared what he might say. And he changed my heart that night. So the answer didn't come like yes or no. The answer came inside where I said, I want to be a missionary. And just that if, if God did call me to do that, and I didn't know that at the time, it took me about eight years till I first went overseas after that, um, or six, six years maybe. Um, but it did spark something that not, this isn't something to run away from or avoid. If God's calling me to do this, it's something to like embrace and to explore with him. That's a, a beautiful story. I'm so encouraged to hear it. And second, um, you brought up something that I'd like to touch on for just a moment. Uh, you, you had this, this, this buffer period, this gap between where you first sort of felt the call, but then you graduated and you began, you got a job in your field um, and you worked for several years and then you were actually uh, able to launch uh, over, this, over the oceans. You actually uh, first served in, in, in one country and now you've relocated to your final destination. Um, I think that probably many people who are listening think that if God were to call them to do something, it would just be, okay, you're here at Stanford and now go here to this other place you're supposed to be. And then we will just start you off tomorrow uh, and you will have instant relationship and context and support and community to be fruitful from day one. Could you talk about the process? And, and like, I'm assuming you didn't feel disobedient in the process. You were stepping along as God was leading you each step of the way. 
Yeah, that's really true. Um, I asked God, like, do you want me to do this right now? And did feel very clearly, like, even some practical reasons, like I didn't know it at the time, but a lot of organizations that send people look at your student loan debt and they won't send you if your student loan debt is over a certain amount or your payments. And they work with people, but that, that is a, a consideration, you know, that they look at because as we're collecting support from people, they don't want it to all go towards paying off your student loans. <laughs> um, and so I had, so I was like, well, I need to work to pay those off. That's the responsibility that I have. Um, and so I was able to do that. Um, but I also then said, okay, what's next? I felt this stirring in me. I have this desire now, what's next? And so I went on a short-term trip with my church. I was, I didn't, I was like, where are you going? I didn't have a region. I was just like, where's the next trip? I'm on it. Um, and then while I was on that trip, I was like, okay, God, is this the place you want me to be long term? Um, and I felt like he said, no, not here and not yet. And then he started putting things on my heart and mind to, that I was supposed to do back um, in my hometown. So he put people on my heart, like extended family members that I felt like, oh, I need to reach out to them and start sharing more with them or um, people that I worked with or, you know, being more intentional about praying for opportunities um, to, with my coworkers that I would find, you know, times where I could share with them about Jesus and that they would know I'm not just a good person, but that I'm a follower of Jesus. And I looked for opportunities to serve within my church. So I think in those six years, I grew a lot in um, confidence in like, leading a small group and reaching out to international students. Um, we were located near a university. And so I was, did English conversational classes with uh, students that were studying in America and got the opportunity to share with several of them um, through relationship about Jesus. And um, so that, yeah, so those steps, I think were preparing me and also just what God wanted me to do in the moment. And then I also did look, you know, I was looking for opportunities to go overseas short term. And then I went um, finally to a conference, the World Mission Summit as a participant and just looked around like, okay, I'm, I'm ready, God. What do you, I put myself in environments where God could speak to me and where I was asking him, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And then when it was time, like, he was speaking to me in many different ways from many different angles that just made it really clear. Now is the time and this is the region I want you to serve in. That's super cool. By the way, uh, to the students, that conference that Dee just mentioned, the World Mission Summit, is a, uh, a periodic Chi Alpha conference that happens uh, globally. Uh, and we were scheduled to have one this coming January, but because of coronavirus, it's been pushed back. Uh, and so you'll be hearing from me about that later. And uh, as Dee will tell you, it's a really powerful conference. Whether you think you're called to missions or not, uh, uh, it's about God at work in the world and in your life. And I think you'll be very, very uh, blessed. And I encourage you to put it on your uh, priority list even now. Okay, Dee, uh, sometimes uh, I hear students say that really all religions are basically the same, that, that sincerity is what really matters. As long as you're into something uh, and it's working for you, uh, that's good. Now, clearly you don't believe that. So what differences do you see between uh, the different religions, particularly the one that you're mostly interacting with your host culture and the gospel? Sure. Well, um, I've had friends here try to tell me, oh, we're basically the same. Um, and it, I, I think it's coming from like a good place in their heart of like, oh, like, I like you, I respect you. You know, I, I want to have, have like peaceful, good interactions. But I don't, I actually don't like those conversations. And when someone makes a statement like that, I, not in an argumentative way, but in a loving kind of way, want to bring up some of the differences. And I do that not by like attacking what they believe, but by making statements that I know they won't agree with. So, you know, if I say, oh, I believe that Jesus is the only way to God oh, yeah, I don't believe that. And so I said, so we're not really the same. <laughs> um, 
you know, I believe anyone can go to God through Jesus, but you have to go through him and through belief in him. Or, um, you know, even one thing that often gets people is when I say, you know, I'm sure that I'm going to heaven because of my faith in Jesus. Um, he has saved me and I, it's written in his word that whoever has the son has eternal life. And so I know that I'm going to go be with God forever when I die. And they go, oh, you, we can never know. I can never know. Um, there's going to be a weighing and a judgment later on in life, when, when I die. And I can't know, even the best person, even our highest prophet couldn't know for sure that he was going to go to heaven because only God knows. Um, and I also kind of challenged the thing of like, okay, you think I'm a good person. Well, I believe that I'm not a good person and that I'm not good enough to get to heaven. Um, I believe that no one is. And whereas they view it as like, you, you want your good deeds to outweigh the bad deeds. Um, some analogies that we try to use are like, any sin is impurity, it's dirty. Like if you um, have a glass of water and it's all water, and like, I take just a little bit of poop, just a little bit. I mean, it's very small, but I put it in there. Would you drink this? Oh, no, of course not. You're like, well, that's, what, that's how I believe things work. That's how I believe God views our sin, that it's serious. Even if you do a lot of good things, the bad things you do need forgiveness from God, not more work by yourself. Um, so with the people I work here who, and their religion, that. Uh, those are some of the conversations that we have, and um, I like to make those statements that cause them to see, oh, we aren't quite all the same. And then some people that will prompt them to like, well, I want to understand more about what you believe and can lead into deeper discussion and study. Very good. Um, now, a common criticism that you hear of missions at a place like Stanford is it really it's just colonialism all over again. Uh, it's it's this act of, of of cultural imperialism, and you are an agent of of Western uh, civilization trying to disrupt this established civilization and community, and you're just doing a bad thing. Could could you comment on that? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that statement like assumes that Christianity belongs to a certain culture. Um, or has a political agenda, which certainly it has in the past. I mean, I'm not, there are ways that, as you study history, that like missions and political agendas were being like used in a way that I wouldn't agree with um, in the past. Or, but looking at what I do, um, I believe the gospel for all cultures and all people. I believe that the message of Jesus um, is for, you know, the vision of heaven is that all nations and tribes and tongues and people will be there together worshiping God. And sometimes the stories from God's word, I find they have more relevance here because the culture comes from kind of a rural life and, um, you know, even like caring for animals and things. That's like so much part of the culture here traditionally that some of the Bible stories come to life more. My understanding of it grows through my uh, interaction with um, people. For example, one of my friends, when I was talking about um, Jesus being the Messiah and that word Messiah um, or Christ, meaning the anointed one, I would say, well, in the past, like when God chose a leader, religious or, or a king for the nation of Israel, he would pour oil. They would pour oil on this person's head to show that they were chosen by God. It represented God's choosing of them and his spirit that was being given to them because they have the idea of Jesus is Messiah, but they don't know what that word Messiah means. And so when I talk about that, she's like, oh yeah, in our culture, they do that with milk. Um, when a leader is chosen, they pour the milk on. Oh yeah, of course. I'm like, okay, because it's a weird thing for my culture. Like when I get dabbed with oil, I'm like, you know, I have enough grease in my hair already. I just want to like, it's not part of my culture at all. And so um, as an as a individual and as a team, we're having, we always have these kind of conversations 
uh, we're consciously trying to strip away our own cultural Christian expression from the core truths of the gospel. There, an exercise that we did in our training that was really good was we put out a sheet of paper and we're supposed to draw and write things that represent what is the, what is church. So we wrote all these things and then they said, now go through and edit your paper and everything that's on there must have a basis in scripture. And so you start going, well, the instruments we use are cultural and the way our buildings, even the fact that we build another building to meet in is a cultural thing that works for us, but doesn't, might not necessarily work in another culture. Um, even the way of maybe your church chooses leadership or something, that's not mandated um, by scripture, the, the process of choosing leaders, you know, it could like by voting or something like, and there's a lot, of, there's different um, things that I try, that I'm consciously trying to like unlearn or, or not transmit to someone else. And, and part of that is the reason why learning language is really important. I want to, as much as possible, like present the truth about the gospel in the heart language of the person that I'm sharing with um, so that God's word can speak to them. And I want God's word to inform the church that's being formed here. And I want them not to say, oh, I learned it from this foreigner that came, but this person, this foreigner who came introduced me to God's word and his word is what guides our decisions and guides our community and guides our fellowship. Um, so that, those are some thoughts I have about that. <laughs> Very helpful. Um, you mentioned that uh, we had that group come by, I think it was the traveling team, uh, who came and spoke at Stanford uh, when you were doing your studies here. And they gave a list of four reasons that people are reluctant to consider a gospel call, um, especially the international work. Um, uh, basically, uh, I think that our students, many of them are reluctant to even consider the idea because they feel like they're throwing away a world-class education or maybe they owe uh, their parents uh, a level of financial or social success, or they're really worried about getting married. Um, do you have any thoughts on that that you could share? Sure. I think one of the main things uh, in thinking about that is, first of all, and maybe just to speak directly to the students, like if this is something that is stirring in your heart, um, don't let the fears be speaking louder than God is. And so maybe someone who's asking those questions, they're asking it because they feel a stirring in their heart. And, but, but the, the journey to what that could look like or the obstacles that might come along the way um, feel just too over, like overwhelming or that might overpower um, the call of God on their life. And so like there's a time and a place in your private time with God that he can help you sort through your fears and your motives because he knows your heart. And so I definitely would say if, if you're hesitating because of fear, that fear isn't from God, and he wants to address that fear. Whatever he calls you to do, he doesn't want you to choose one thing because you're afraid to do the other, afraid to disappoint your parents, afraid that um, you might um, not live up to your potential, that your peers or your mentors or professors think that you should live up to. Um, and then, I think also like God wants to challenge our view of ministry, um, you know, to say that maybe that serving God among the unreached, and I don't have an opportunity here to use my education background directly. What I'm doing is not what I studied at Stanford. Um, but to say that that's a waste of my education, I think maybe doesn't have a correct view of the calling to serve God and to serve him in ministry and the impact that we can have on people's lives. Um, you know, what's going to be most important at the end of, at the end of life. Um, you know, if, if you're feeling stirred by the thought of someone who might live their whole life without an adequate witness to the gospel, you know, don't set that aside. Um, to go pursue something that's gonna elevate you in the eyes of men. Now, 
I know that God uses people in ministry, in the workplace. Um, so if that's what you feel, if you put it all on the table and you feel God leading you there, like I also want to affirm that. But if you're not putting all the options on the table, I would challenge you to look at what is your view of ministry and someone who focuses their career and their work energy towards sharing the gospel with people and discipling them and what, you know, that's, that's a high calling. And um, also, yeah, just ask God to help you sort through the fears in your heart um, that he can speak to those things and walk you through them. <laughs> So uh, if you had a time machine, is there anything you'd like to go back and say to uh, D back in college, uh, either your undergrad or your grad school days? Something you wish you had realized back then that took you a while to clue into? Sure. One thing in light of the work that I do now, um, I mean, I was part of Chi Alpha. I was looking for opportunities to share my faith, um, but I was most comfortable sharing my faith with people that were very similar to me. <laughs> that came from a similar background or maybe, you know, were like a lapsed Christian. I felt like it was easier to share with the person that kind of knew in their heart they were disobeying God and like bring, you know, let's work to move you back closer to God. And I was honestly had a lot of fear in talking to people that were from other religions. I was afraid they would ask questions I didn't know the answer to. I was afraid I would offend them maybe if we started talking about that. Um, I found that often asking someone questions and seeking to learn more about their faith can then open the door to an exchange of ideas um, that I just wish I would have taken advantage more of those opportunities. When I think of some classmates and casual friends I had that were of different faiths, I didn't, I, I was afraid to talk to them about that. And um, now I'm like, well, it's not so bad. And I, I wish I would have learned. I think I missed an opportunity maybe to learn from them even. Um, maybe to so into their life, you know, and that God could have done something through me, but also to learn from them. To, um, I, I, I'm doing that now. I think I can't go back and change the past, but I wish I could tell my younger self not to be so afraid to have those conversations. People really often can see your heart when you're coming at it, whether you're coming to argue or you're coming to seek to understand and love them. Um, so that's one thing. <laughs> uh, I hope you heard that, uh, that D, uh, while a student, uh, was not uh, taking the campus by storm for the gospel, was not at every turn just preaching the word, seeing whole dorms come to Christ. Uh, she was living a life just like you, uh, and God was able to intersect that in a powerful way. Um, and uh, you did bear good fruit at Stanford. I think you know that. Uh, but um, you've, you've, you've gone on to do even greater things. Um, and like I tell people pretty often, uh, if, you, if you look at Stanford as a high point of your life, and it's all downhill from here, you have a very sad life. Uh, you go from glory to glory. And so I look forward uh, to seeing what all of you do over decades to come. Uh, Dee, as we conclude, uh, how can we pray for you? Sure. Oh, man. I could use a lot of prayer. <laughs> I mean, uh, the reality of the situation here, you know, and the people group I serve among is there are few believers and many of those who do, of those who do come to faith in Christ, a lot of them feel fear and even telling one other person outside of, it's easier to share with a foreigner because I'm not part of your community and the risk is much smaller, you know, um, and so I mean, for me personally, like I want to grow in my sensitivity to what the Holy Spirit's doing. Our team's been talking a lot about that lately, the Holy Spirit, and his work and um, acknowledging, honestly, like the two friends I told you about who I'm able to share with really clearly, they want to read the Bible together. They're asking good questions and kind of wrestling through like, what do I believe? I'm open to hearing about something else out there different from what I was raised in. Um, those are totally like the Holy Spirit opened those doors. Like I didn't shove my way in, but after knowing them for a while, they felt enough trust to ask some questions and 
So I just, I'm praying for more of those opportunities. I, I think there's more of those people out there. If I'm just one person and in the last couple of years, I've met two people that are interested, like there must be more out there in this country. <laughs> And I want to, I need God's help to find them uh, and to connect with them. And I want the words that I say to be moving like in step with the spirit, like in partnership with what he's doing. And so um, you can just pray for me for like um, greater sensitivity and leading from the Holy Spirit uh, as I share with people and spend time with them. Um, and then you can pray for um, boldness for believers here. Um, several, a, a couple of people we know who do follow Jesus have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, as described in the book of Acts. They've read those passages and seem like, okay, there's some pretty cool stuff that God does through his Holy Spirit. I haven't experienced that yet and I want to. Um, and so, uh, I just, they're asking for it. They're asking for more of God's spirit. And it says that um, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's what it says in Acts 1. And I want them to receive that so that they will receive that boldness to be God's witness to their friends or family starting in their community and God using them. I mean, we want, I, I want to work myself out of a job to where like the church takes off and is thriving here and has um, people that God has appointed to be the leaders here. Um, and so right now, what the people that we do know are asking for is, is more of God's spirit. And maybe I see that they, are lacking in boldness and there's fear there's a lot of fear uh, and those fears are based in real consequences that could happen in their sharing um, but I, I really hope and I try to point them to God's word and the things where Jesus knows the persecutions that they're gonna face he describes them pretty specifically as he was talking to his disciples and people who have died for their faith um, God used their deaths in powerful ways even. And so those are the things that I pray uh, over my friends here. <laughs> okay, um, well, we're gonna pray for you right now. Um, and uh, is it okay? Uh, if, if a student wants to connect with you more, I, I'm gonna suggest, would you please email me and then I will forward that on uh, to, to D here. Uh, and then D can communicate back with you in whatever way uh, she deems most wise or appropriate. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Awesome. Uh, God, we bless um, our friend D. Um, uh, you brought her from Stanford to around the world where she is serving you in a new context, a different place. God, I pray that just as you led her by the spirit to this location, you would lead her by the spirit in this location. God, I pray you would guide her words, you would guide her actions, uh, that she would both speak and act prophetically even when she doesn't realize it. God, open her eyes to see the work you're up to in the lives of those around her, God, um, that she would see many people who are asking, seeking, knocking, that she would be able to um, be your answer to their prayers. And God, I pray for those who've already begun to follow you and those who are on that journey, Lord, that you would empower them with the spirit, fill them with boldness, a holy, resolute boldness. And God, that you would do signs and wonders through them. And God, that they would glorify you at every turn. And Lord, that we would see a breakout of the gospel in Dee's um, new hometown in her mission field. Uh, and that um, a healthy church would be built. God be glorified, provide for her, protect her. Um, and God, comfort her and and uh, uh, I pray for her health and sanity during this uh, season of pandemic. God be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much.
gift from you, that we've done nothing to earn it, Lord. Thank you that you've opened our eyes to see how, how we were living before and how our ways were wrong and how you brought us into the light, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you that you've entered our hearts and you've set us apart. Thank you that you live inside of us and every day and you lead us and you guide us, Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. As you leave tonight, remember, you're not just logging off a website. You're leaving as part of a community if you want to be. We're Chi Alpha, a community of students earnestly following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our name reminds us of our mission. Chi Alpha, Christ's ambassadors. That's who we are. And it's what we do. We represent a king. We make friends on our sovereign's behalf. We advance his interest wherever we find ourselves. And since our king is in the blessing business, that means we are too. So go forth with an eager expectation to see how God intends to use you to bless others. Go forth with faith in your heart, hope upon your countenance, and love upon your lips. God bless and please do join us in our Zoom lobby if your schedule permits. Great way to connect, uh, dig deeper, and also spend some time together with other believers in prayer after the service.